name is Brandy Likes, and I'm the Chemistry Section Supervisor for the St. Louis County Police Crime Laboratory. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Forensic Chemistry and take you on a tour of our section. The Chemistry Section is made up of three distinct disciplines, seized drugs, fire debris, and explosives. Our chemists analyze evidence from over 60 different police departments within St. Louis County and federal agencies, including ATF, DEA, and FBI. Before we get started on our tour, I would like to talk briefly about what it takes to become a forensic chemist as I get asked this question often. While it is a requirement that you have a degree in a natural science, it is not a requirement that you have a chemistry degree. That said, we are working in a local chemistry lab, so certain courses are required, such as organic chemistry one and two and quantitative analysis or its equivalent. We need scientists with a basic understanding of the fundamentals of chemistry. We'll teach you how to become a forensic chemist. So we're going to begin our tour in the drug section where chemists analyze unknown powders, liquids, tablets, and plant material for the presence of controlled or illicit substances. And examples of commonly seen illicit substances that we see in our crime laboratory include cocaine, fentanyl, and methamphetamine. When we refer to things as being illicit or controlled, what we're talking about are drugs that are listed either federally or on the state level as being in schedules one through five. For example, schedule one drugs such as heroin have no known medicinal uses and have a very high potential for abuse. Schedule two drugs such as fentanyl also have a high potential for abuse, but have no medicinal uses. Our chemists must also stay informed of new drugs entering our region. This includes ensuring that our analytical techniques are current, that we have known standards available, and that we stay informed of current legal status. We routinely have new drugs into our region that have the potential to be very dangerous, but they aren't currently controlled. Our chemists use a variety of analytical techniques and instrumentation to include color test, FTIR, and GCMS. Our chemists also spend a great deal of time educating law enforcement on things such as drug trends, um, drug labs and precursors, safe handling, and proper packaging. So now we're going to demonstrate a color test. A color test is just a simple presumptive test that provides us with an indicator chemically of what we're dealing with. Now, that said, color tests do not confirm the presence of controlled substances. Um, what they do is sort of lead us in the right direction of maybe a specific um, drug class or a specific chemical structure. The color test that we're gonna to demonstrate today is a two-part color test known as Simon's test. And what Simon's test does is it reacts in the presence of a specific chemical structure called secondary amines. Examples of drugs that are secondary amines include methamphetamine and MDMA. When we perform a color test, we typically add the reagent to an empty spot well to ensure that it's clean. As you can see, there's no reaction. We then add a small amount of the sample and wait for a reaction. As you can see, we have a nice blue color reaction. Again, this is an indicator of a possible secondary amine. This does not confirm the presence of a controlled substance. So now that we've performed our color test and got an indication that we have a secondary amine, we must now confirm the identity of the controlled substance. One of the instruments we use for confirmation is an FTIR. We simply take a small portion of the sample and place it on the sample window. We then crush the sample to ensure sample distribution on the sample window. So the spectrum produced now is um, unique to the molecular structure of our unknown compound. It's basically a molecular fingerprint of that structure. So now we are entering the main chemistry instrument lab. As you can see, this laboratory is full of instrumentation to include mostly GC mass specs. So GC mass specs are another um, instrument we use for the confirmation and identification of controlled substances. Unlike the FTIR, the GC mass spec actually allows for separation and identification of every component in an unknown mixture. Once we reviewed all of our analytical data and completed our case file, a final report may be issued. Now we're gonna to tour the fire debris and explosives laboratory. On the fire debris side, chemists analyze samples for the presence of ignitable liquids. Ignitable liquids include things such as gasoline, charcoal lighter fluid, and tiki torch fuel, and are used to accelerate a fire. Determining the presence of ignitable liquids assists fire investigators determine origin and cause in suspicious fires. Now, our cases are not limited to only commercial and residential fires, but also include homicides, insurance fraud, serial arsonists, civil unrest, and incendiary devices such as Molotov cocktails. On the analysis side, the same GC mass spec that's used to confirm and identify the presence of drugs is also used to confirm the presence of ignitable liquids. 
That said, sample prep for fire debris is very different. Packaging is very important for fire debris samples as the whole goal of our analysis is to try and collect any ignitable liquid vapors that may be trapped within the sample. We wanna make sure that we have plenty of room in the evidence can for these vapors to move around as they're heating. So Ryan is actually gonna take the activated charcoal strip and he's gonna hang it on the inside of the can. And he's gonna do this by placing a magnet on the outside of the can. He's then gonna take a paper clip and insert the activated charcoal strip and simply hang it on the inside of the can. He will then reseal the can and we'll place it in one of the two ovens that we have. We heat these samples in order to increase the mobility of the ignitable liquid vapors that may be present in order to adhere to the activated charcoal strip. Chemists on the explosive side provide support to the St. Louis Regional Bomb and Arson Unit. This includes bomb squads from St. Louis City Police, St. Louis County Police Departments, St. Charles County, and federal agencies to include FBI and ATF. Explosives evidence may only be submitted by certified bomb technicians or certified explosive specialists. Explosives analysis involves the identification of explosives, explosive precursors, chemicals found at homemade explosives labs, and components used to assemble improvised explosive devices such as pipe bombs. Chemists use a wide variety of analytical techniques to include GC mass spec, FTIR, X-ray diffraction, and SEM. However, before the analysis can begin, the chemist must first document all the components submitted. This includes taking measurements, taking photographs, and taking the individual components and looking at them under a stereoscope, looking for particles and residues that may be used for further analysis. This is the Scanning Electron Microscope, or SEM. The SEM is a very powerful tool in our laboratory and it's used for the analysis of explosives. The SEM is a microscope, however, it's a very powerful microscope that allows us to image tiny particles such as post-blast particles. Our SEM also has an X-ray detector. This detector allows us to not only image these tiny particles, but we can determine the elemental makeup of those particles. Our chemists may be called to assist regional bomb squads in the field by providing guidance on explosives, explosive precursors, chemical hazards, safe handling, and proper packaging. Our chemists also receive ongoing training on explosive trends that are occurring both domestically and globally. Um, we use this information to then teach uh, local bomb squads and military on the awareness and recognition of homemade explosives. I hope y'all enjoyed that little insight into forensic chemistry and thank you for stopping by.